I have no idea how long this has been going on. Hi, how you doing? We're going to try to get through this as fast as we can. Um, uh, it's about six o'clock. I've been here since six. I've been working on this thing since six. So um, and it's important to me that I get through this with you because you've get you've gotten a little bit of this so far, but there's so many times in the past few years where people have said, you've got to talk more about the Patriot Act and, and uh, um, you know, September 11th and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm just going to do my best to, to help get you all ready. So please, 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 please try your best to pay attention. You're supposed to be taking your notes. There should be a note packet that the sub gave you. Fill them in as we're going through. You get points for this video this Ed puzzle and you get points for the note packet. It is summative. It's worth points, summative points, like a test. I have with me my friends, Batman and the Craig head. So they might talk, they might not because I want to go fast for your sake and mine. Uh, Cause I've been here a long time. So anyway, um, having said that, let's let's get going. We're, we're looking at content statements 28 to 33. We're looking at the, the final few content statements here and just going over them again. So here it says right here, content statement. Um, ooh. Can you see that? Content statement 28. The post-war economic boom and advances in science and technology produced changes in American life. Imagine that. We're talking about change in history class. Goodness. Okay. Here we go. Post-war. What does that mean? Uh, in this case, it means World War II. Post-World War II. Post-World War II. Right. Basically, we're talking about 1945 to 1970-ish, right? Um, that was a time of unprecedented prosperity. If you don't know what the word unprecedented means, it's right there. Never seen before. Prosperity, if you don't know that word, well, here it is. It means economic success. And so basically we had never seen this much economic success. We've had good times in the past, but these two decades-ish were some of the best years of economic growth in U.S. history. What caused this prosperity? Increased demand for goods and services, the growth of the suburbs, and the baby boom. Let's get into those. Increased demand for goods and services. People had saved a lot of money during World War II. They had to save money during World War II because the government was rationing. Remember that? Government, FDR during World War II said, you're only allowed to buy so much. So we had all this money saved up, and after the war, people want to spend, spend, spend that money like gangbusters. Here's a picture. I shop, therefore I am. This is what we call consumerism, that people get their worth and their value out of buying things. And that somewhat characterized America in the 50s and 60s. Um, and here's some of the things we were buying. That's an old-fashioned television set. I bet yours doesn't look like that. Growth of the suburbs. What were people spending their money on? New houses. And these houses were not in the inner cities like before they had been when people had jobs in the cities. People moved out of the cities. They didn't like the crime. They moved outside of the big cities to the suburbs. Now, I know that you know what a suburb is, but I'm going to give you some pictures. And if I'm going too fast, please feel free to pause it so you can get the blanks filled in. But here's one of the first suburbs. It was called Levitt Town, named after a guy named Levitt. I can't remember his first name. Um, and all of his houses look the same. And they're all packed tight, close together, but they were for the middle class. And people, some people, many people for the first time in their lives were able to afford a house for them and their spouse and their kids at a garage and a driveway and so on, instead of renting in those big apartment complexes, tenements in big cities. Finally, the baby boom. Unprecedented. Darn you. 
unprecedented growth of the U.S. population, there was an explosion of people being born um, from 45 to 65, 1965. There are more babies born in one generation than in any other time in U.S. history. We've had other growths in population, but this was why were there so many people being born? Well, um, as you can imagine, the soldiers coming home were happy to see their wives. Um, they had money to start a family. And they had a house. You know, house in the suburbs that they could live in with their family. And so um, lots of people born. And this generation, the baby boom generation, you call them boomers now. They are about 70 years old, 80 years old, some of them. And they are the, the generation that is retiring. What you say, Craig? Craig's trying to say something. I thought that boomers were old, cringy, crusty people. Well, they can be, Craig. For our purposes, though, look at this. This red, this is the baby boom generation from 45 to about 65. Just a ton of people born more than before during the war and during the Great Depression and more than afterwards. Lots of people born. This generation is beginning to die off now. What else was going on in American society? Improvements in technology and science. After the war, American life changed, and a lot of it changed for the better, for the middle class anyway. As far as medicine goes, just a couple things. I mean, there's tons more stuff, but a couple things. Birth control pill so that you can plan your family. Polio vaccine, which my grandfather was too late for, you know, that he had polio. I know I've told you that before. Um, do you remember what president had polio? Do you remember? Hmm? Hmm? All right. Um, saved lots of kids' lives, saved lots of kids um, being able to you know, not have to walk with crutches for the rest of their lives. And the vaccine was not as controversial as the COVID vaccine. Not, not by a long shot. We also get nuclear power. You know that the nuclear bomb went off in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but we didn't just use nuclear power for those two atomic bombs and then nothing else ever. After that, we're also using it now to create electricity. Electricity that doesn't pollute the atmosphere. It might create radioactive uranium bars that get buried places that cause the fish to grow three eyes. Just kidding, hopefully. Um, but yeah, use for electricity instead of destruction. Transportation, there's a lot more passenger airplanes that were more affordable that people could buy. So people were flying more in the 50s than they had ever flown in the previous three decades. And people were driving more cars than in the previous three decades. There were more cars bought and registered in the 50s and in the 20s. And one of the reasons this was is because having the automobile was a rite of passage, a something coming of age. Like if you were an American teenager, this it was something you look forward to. And pe because people, their parents had money to spend, they were getting them for the teenage generation for really, I think the first time in, in US history. <clears throat> Birth control pill. Uh, Jonas Salk was the name of the guy who got us the um, polio vaccine. This is what they want you to be able to know and be able to do with this information. Describe how American life in the post-war period was impacted by post-World War II, the post-World War II economic boom and by advances in science and technology. That little dot is not supposed to be there. Crud. Content statement 29. Let's buzz through it. All right, let's go fast. Content statement 29, new content statement. What's this one about? This one is about people moving. 
The continuing population flow from cities to suburbs, the internal migrations from the Rust Belt to the Sun Belt, and the increase in immigration resulting from the passage of the 1965 Immigration Act has social and political effects. Mr. Bayard. Yes, Batman. You should read slower and take a get better breaths in between what you're reading, especially when it's a long passage. Shut up, Batman. Do what I want. Darn Batman. What is this content statement about? It's about the movement of people. It's about the post-war movement of people, meaning post-World War II movement of people. Again, if I'm going too fast, just pause the video. It's okay. It's okay. Isn't it, Craig? It's okay, Craig. Yes, Mr. Beavers. I had you for two classes and I did just fine. That's my Craig impression. Captain America is a wimp. Iron Man's the best you can see behind me. One of my former students from Logan Elm drew that for me. I've kept it ever since. Why are people moving and what are people moving for and where are they moving to and from? Okay, so one of the major migrations after World War II was from people moving from the cities to the suburbs. In association with that movement, what we have are several things, and some of these aren't good. This one is not necessarily good. Uh, white flight. What is white flight? White flight is basically white people leaving inner cities. One of the things they want to do is to escape crime. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. I mean, you know, if, if I wouldn't want to be in a place where there was a whole bunch of people getting shot and theft and all that kind of stuff. But maybe, and def not maybe, definitely, a negative reason, a negative thing about white flight was that they were trying to escape school integration. Um, they didn't like some of these white people had racist motives for leaving the inner cities and going out to the suburbs so they could go to, you know, schools that were white, mostly white, um, and they wouldn't have to worry about the problems that might come with desegregating the schools. So that was not necessarily good. And when this white flight occurred, there was also something called redlining, uh, basically taking red ink on a map and drawing a line around this neighborhood. And um, inside the line, white people could get loans for houses because usually inside the line, those were nice neighborhoods. And um, if a black citizen wanted to get inside that, that line, they usually could not get loans from banks to get a mortgage for their a house inside there. Um, and so then they were only allowed to go out to basically get neighbor, um, get loans for houses in poor neighborhoods. So there's definitely some racism going on with this. This is not good. Uh, one of the other things we have here is political polarization. <coughs> Separating. <coughs> <clears throat> of course, this is the time that I'm going to start coughing. Why not? Political differences increased during this time period. Republican versus Democrat. We're not close together anymore. We're polarizing, going to the polls, if you will. You know, like North Pole, South Pole, like the, yeah, anyway, opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, cities tend to be liberal ever since World War II ended. That means that they a very high percentage of the cities vote Democrat, like 80, 90 percent. I, I, I challenge you to find me a city that has over 100,000 people in this country that doesn't vote 80 to 90 percent Democrat. Suburbs tended to be more conservative, maybe not as conservative as you, as you might think, because there's a lot of college educated people and college educated people tend to be liberal. But the suburbs lean Republican. So we have the cities being made up of one types of voter and the suburbs being made of other types of voters. And one reason for this white flight, again, was the urban riots of 1960s, in addition to school integration. And those urban riots, sometimes unfairly, 
were associated with the civil rights movement. And so the, the, the racial divide as well as a political divide is all wrapped up in this. And this is just an example of redlining how these neighborhoods were had red lines drawn around them and some people, white people allowed in, some people, black people not allowed in. Not a good, this is illegal now, by the way, to do this as it should be. Another migration, uh, I, I've been hitting on this pretty hard. I think you should know this uh, pretty pretty well, but let's just go through it. Rust Belt to Sun Belt, that's another migration pattern. So we've got cities to suburbs, we've got Rust Belt to Sun Belt. Rust Belt, again, you know this, northern states that used to have the jobs, the factory jobs, the manufacturing jobs, used to. Place like here, Michigan, Detroit. Chicago, right? Sunbelt, southern states, where it's sunny, where the jobs, the factories are moving to ever since World War II. Employment opportunities were found in defense plants. So a lot, especially during the Vietnam War, Korean War, and their factories were needed to make war materials and Southern states are places where these businesses went to set up shop and they had lots of jobs and they supplied the military in a time when we were needing a lot of military supplies. Um, also high tech industries. You've probably heard of Silicon Valley where all of your computer software and apps on your phones and all that kind of stuff is made internet companies in California. That's in the Sun Belt. So military suppliers, producers, and high-tech jobs in the Sun Belt. The location, you know, really, it's all about location, location, location. You know, wherever your, your house is, you know, the location is going to help determine the value. Well, the location of where people are going to are southern states, southern California, and Arizona, and and so on, where the weather is nice, longer. They are leaving. The jobs left places like Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, where you have Wisconsin, where you have colder winters. Sunbelt states grew in population and power because of this. More people means more political power. So Sunbelt states like, for example, Texas, boom in population. Some belt states like California, especially Southern California, grows in population, which means, politically speaking, they get electoral votes for president, congressional representatives, members of Congress. They get more of them. Ohio is losing, has been losing congressional seats, seats in Congress and electoral votes, while Texas has exploded with electoral votes, and so is California. Now, this has snow belt. So technically, Rust Belt would be up in here, but you kind of, I think you get the, the, the gist, right? Sun Belt is where people want to go and live, and that's where the jobs are going. And defense and high-tech industries. And Rust Belt's up here. That's where the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the Vanderbilts used to be. And now the money is down in here. And again, uh, you know, just looking at where people are going. They're going from these areas to whoosh, 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 down south, southern California, etc. Another a final post-war migration that we need to know about is the third wave of immigration to the United States. And this comes through the Immigration Act of 1965. This is a big, important immigration law. It basically says if you have family here, then it's going to be easier, almost automatic, for your relatives in other countries to come here if you were from the following places, not from Europe, which is where all of our other waves of immigration have come from. But if your family is from Africa, if you have, if you're a Somalian and you you're here. Your family can come over from Somalia really easy. Kenya, same thing. Asia, the, most, the biggest one. Latin America, Mexico, for example. Hispanics, 
are now the largest minority group in the United States. There are more Hispanics in the United Did Batman just die? I take you up, Batman. Hispanics are now. Don't read anything into that. Batman is equal opportunity. He loves everyone. He's just tired. Like you are. Like I am. Hispanic people. There are more you know, white people in the country than, than any other race. Hispanics are number two. They surpassed African Americans being number three now. Now, because of his, the Hispanic population growing big time, because of this 1965 Immigration Act, a major influence has been Spanish language media. Dora the Explorer, Explorer teaches us Spanish, right? But not just that, ESPN Deportes, Spanish language media news broadcasts in Spanish, translations for our media in Spanish, all over the place, right? Things are translated into Spanish on, on signs and so on. And in schools, we now have what are called ESL programs, English as a second language programs. And it's to help Hispanic, a lot of it is to help Hispanic kids who primarily speak Spanish, help them to be able to have the supports they need to get along in school while they're trying to, you know, get better at English. Um, and, uh, you know, that's for Spanish speaking people. Obviously there's tons of people with Hispanic backgrounds who, who speak English as their first language. So, um, yeah, this, I'm just talking about the general effects here. If you look, this was the second wave of immigration right in here during that industrialization era. There was a dip during the uh, Great Depression, World War II, and then in around 65, you can see, boom, and there's a ton that have come from Latin America and from Asia and, you know, a decent amount from Africa. The numbers from Europe, as you can see, was up in here in the gray, and it's, it's dwindled. Okay, these demographic changes, and demographic is in the content statement, but it's just a word that means population changes. Population changes, altered voting patterns, meaning because of all of these movements across the country, cities now vote Democrat and immigrants. Oh, it's right there, Democrat. I shouldn't say. They vote Democrat. Consequences to, 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 to changes, right? And these are some of the consequences. And some of these are, are good. Some of the racist ones I talked about were bad, right? Analyze. This is what they want you to be able to do with content statement 29. Analyze the social and political effects of the continuing population flow from cities to suburbs, Rust Belt to Sun Belt, and the immigration, and as a result of the Immigration Act of 1965. Okay, content statement 30. Political debates focused on the extent of the role of the government in the economy, environmental protection, social welfare, and national security. Why do we argue about things in politics? Why do we argue about politics so much in our country? There's so much else to, to argue about. Why do we focus that to cause so much drama? Well, it's because we've got two, maybe more, but really two major ways of looking at how we think government should be involved in our lives, how much it should be involved in our lives. And that's, you know, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, right? And these two ways are very different. And they have consequences for how well off some people are, right? So it matters. 
And it will matter more to you, especially when you start making bigger paychecks too, right? But um, what role should the government play in the economy? This is one thing that we argue about, right? And, and basically to, to kind of summarize it, um, should the government step in and help businesses when they fail? Should we give them money when they fail? Should the government give them money? And that means tax money. Should the government give tax dollars or whatever, the, wherever the government gets it from, should they give that to businesses? And then should government regulate businesses? Should they stop businesses from doing something? So should they give money and should they stop, help businesses, stop businesses from doing certain things? And then what about individuals, people like you and me? If I'm out of work, should the government step in and help me out? If people are poor or in poverty, should the government, the federal government especially, step in and help individual people out, give them money, which you know almost always is tax dollars, right? In other words, should the government provide more social welfare programs or less social welfare programs? Should the government the federal government provide food stamps, housing vouchers so that you can have a place to live if you don't have much money. Those kind of things. Republicans tend to, not always, but tend to say that the government should do less. And I have that in all caps. See there? Not like no cap, all caps. That is, is that does that confuse you? Do you use the word cap so much that you don't know what all caps means? Shut up, Mr. Beaver. You're making me bored. They know what all caps means. Okay, fine. Republicans say government should be less involved in our lives, especially federal government. Republicans tend to be more okay with state governments, but not as much the federal government. And Republicans tend to say government should not bail out businesses. If you fail, you fail. And if you're out of a job as an individual too, not just businesses, but individuals, if you're out of a job, then you should succeed or you should fail on your own. It shouldn't be the government that does that for you. That helps you with that. Democrats, as you can imagine, tend to say pretty much the opposite, that the government should do more all caps no cap, this is all caps, more to help people out, especially the poor. Sometimes they say we should bail out businesses. President Obama did, and so did, but you know, so did President Bush. So that one is not as easy to figure out. But when you talk about individual people, individual people, sometimes it's not your fault if you lose your job. And if that happens, if you lose your job and it's not your fault, if it's like a big pandemic that's causing problems, right? Employment problems, an economic recession or depression, then maybe the government should step in and help you out temporarily. Two different visions. Republicans saying less federal government. Democrats are saying more federal government. Involvement and spending. Public opinion on this kind of stuff is usually affected by the economy. This is what I mean. Usually the public is more interested in the federal government helping us, businesses and individuals, in social welfare relief, in times when the economy is bad, like the Great Depression. We are more willing to let the government spend lots of money, which is really you know, our money, in order to help us out of bad economic times. And usually the public is less interested in federal government helping businesses and individuals, less interested in social welfare relief in good economic times. We tend to think that bad economic times, if you lose your job, maybe it's probably not your fault. In good economic times, when everybody has a job, if you lose your job, it's your fault and you gotta deal with it. That's what we tend to usually think, right? Here's one era where 
the liberal side of this argument seemed to be winning. And that was the era of the Great Society under Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson's programs of the Great Society were to basically take the New Deal and put it on steroids. It was basically to fight a war on poverty. The federal government during the Great Society programs of the 1960s expanded, the federal government expanded Expanded its involvement in our lives. It did more things for us. Now, there were more taxes and so on, right? Because you got to pay for these programs, but we created programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Do you remember what the difference between Medicare and Medicaid is? Medicare is health care for, you're right, the elderly. Medicaid, what's that for? Good, health care for the poor. The government is doing more things because of the Great Society than it had ever done before. More federal government involvement in our lives. Now, when Ronald Reagan came into office, it seemed like the conservatives started winning more. We call this Reaganomics. It's also called supply side economics. You don't, I, I don't really want to have to explain all that to you. That's my wife calling. I'm recording my lecture, um, so your voice might be recorded what can i do for you where's the van i i need to pick up deja and i need the van it should be out front in the parking lot near the office okay how much more time till you think you're close to the end no idea okay sorry all right bye. bye love you i'm telling you i've been here so long. I have not stopped working on this PowerPoint presentation since, honestly, since about eighth period. I, I stopped a little bit during ninth period. You can ask Biz. Biz can tell you. Biz can tell you. I was working. I was doing more with the class ninth period, but um, I've been working on this ever since. And I'm supposed to be going to church tonight. I'm supposed to be going to the art show. So I'm sorry if I missed your art show. I'm supposed to be going to see the 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 choir performance there's a baseball game that Beta wants me to go to and i gotta go to church and i'm missing it all because i've got to get this in i have to get you to get this information in <sighs> tomorrow while i'm out so we don't waste time because we're so close to this end of course exam why does this mean so much to you mr beavers because it's our way to prove to the outside world, to our entire community, to the state, whoever, that we've we've learned something, that we've we've accomplished something here this year. And your performance on the end of course exam can can do that. So anyway, back to this. It's about time, Mister Piver. Stop. Stop complaining and just get done with it. Okay, you're right, Batman. Let's 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 lock in, as you say, lock in, lock, lock, lock in. The Gray Society was a time period where the liberals seemed to get their way more, and the federal government did more during. And that was in the '60s, the mid '60s. In the 1980s, Ronald Reagan was elected. He was a Republican and he was a conservative, and he said, "Let's cut." government spending and government programs. Let's decrease the amount of money we spend on those things. And let's cut taxes too. So less money was spent on social welfare programs during Reagan's time in office. And there were less regulations on businesses. And you know, businesses, if they get regulated by the federal government, they can they, they can spend a lot more money than they wanted to, right? If your business is polluting, and the federal government comes along and says, you just got to stop polluting, then that costs a lot of money to, to, to revamp everything so that you're not polluting anymore. I mean, just go to the Mead and tell like, oh, I mean, they spent a lot of money on that. It still stinks, right? But the point is that cuts into the business's profits. And what, the, what Reagan is saying is let's just get government out of the way there so that businesses can make better profits, which will help all of us make money. That's what they were saying. So there should be less government involvement. Our arguments are basically over. Should there be more government spending, less 
government spending and less government involvement in our like okay batman's out he's just he's just bored so let's let's race we also argue about environmental protection craig will stay with me though he won't fall down environmental protection we argue about that liberals conservatives argue about that um and here's a summary of what we say. I mean, nobody really wants the earth to be polluted, right? We don't want a filthy planet. We don't want to have nasty drinking water like they do in Flint, Michigan, right? Um, you know, too soon. Nobody wants that. Conservative or we don't want to go outside and just breathe in smog. The question is, though, should the federal government be in charge of the cleanup process? Should the federal government be the one who's regulating businesses and, and making businesses spend lots of money that's going to cut into their profits in order to clean up the environment? In the post-war period, the liberals seemed to get their way more because there was more federal spending, the federal government was spending more money researching all the effects of all these business practices. So there was all these pesticides being used on our farm products, which was supposed to kill pests eating our, our crops. Come to find out, some of those things just aren't good for us to eat. It's better to have a worm in your corn than to have the chemicals sprayed on your corn. More federal spending on pollution studies, more federal spending to have research to study nuclear waste disposal. What should we do with all those uranium radioactive bars that are left over after we use them to make electricity? And what about global climate change? The liberals got their way in this early 70s when the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA was created. The interesting thing was, though, the EPA was not created under a Democrat. It was created under a Republican, and that was uh, that Republican was Richard Nixon. I mean, but it's no, there's no question that the the globe is getting hotter and hotter, right? Um, now that's that's well over a decade old information, right? Um, it, it, I'm sure it's gone up more since then. And that's more alarming. This may not seem like a lot that it's just like, you know, two degrees Fahrenheit, like, you know, less than about half a degree Celsius, but that actually can change a lot. So like, you know, what should we do about it? Well, should the federal government have anything to do with it? Liberal or not conservative. And finally, we argue about national security. Oh, look at that. Start writing. Right, 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 right. I gave you all of those at the same time so you could start writing. We also argue, liberals versus conservatives, over how much power should the federal government have in order to protect our rights and our safety. Are you willing to give the government more power in order to keep you safe? Not me. You should have seen me in Batman Dark Knight. You know, the one where I defeated the Joker and Two-Face? Oh, I did not want my rights violated. It's okay, Batman. How much power are you willing to give the federal government in order to keep you safe? Well, during the Red Scare, the second Red Scare especially, we seem to allow the government the power to hunt down communists in order to protect us from communist infiltration and subversion. And if you don't know what communist infiltration and subversion is, it means basically it basically means communist infiltrating. That means they're getting inside the government. Subversion means they're trying to overthrow the government. We won't let that happen, will we, Batman? He's sleeping. He's snoring. Okay. Isn't that right, Craig? Craig won't. Craig won't go to sleep on me. During protests, like anti-Vietnam War protests, civil rights movements protests, should people be allowed, and that should say be allowed right there, to protest if they are violent? And there were some anti-Vietnam War protests that were violent. Should they be allowed to? They have the right to, to protest, don't they? Should they allow be allowed to if they're violent? 
And some civil rights, but not all, but some civil rights protests were violent. Some that were associated with the civil rights movement, even though they may not have started out as riots or civil rights organizations. Um, how do I say this? They might have seemed like they were affiliated with the civil rights movement, but really weren't. Anyway, I should edit that out, but I'm not going to because of time. But basically, um, no matter who you are, should you be allowed to be violent in while you're protesting? And a lot of people said no. And the federal government actually sent people to e follow even Martin Luther King. The FBI sent people to follow Martin Luther King. Look up the name J. Edgar Hoover and Intel Pro. He sent people to infiltrate civil rights organizations because he thought they were communists, right? What about after September 11th? Should we be able to torture suspected terrorists so that we can find out where maybe other terrorists are or maybe where the next terrorist attack is going to be? We've argued over these things, all four of these things and more, a lot when it comes to national security and our safety. And it really isn't clear. I can't tell you clear cut where Democrats and Republicans fall on, especially these issues, because it just kind of changes every decade or so. So point is, we, we argue about it. Right. We argue about how much power should we give the federal government to fight the red communist menace. Okay. Expectations for learning here. Explain why the government's role in the economy, environmental protections, and social welfare and national security became topics for political debates between 1945 and 1994. That's what they want you to be able to do with that. Now, that was too much time. On that one, let's start racing through. We're more than halfway done here. Content statement 31. Improved global communications, international trade, transnational business organization, overseas competition, and the shift from manufacturing to service industries have impacted the American economy. There have been changes that are called globalization. The world has become more connected even in my lifetime. And that's changed a lot about our society in ways that we still haven't been able to really figure out yet. Okay, so many of these developments in the last 30 years have included things like improved global communications. International trade has accelerated and, and grown and the connectedness of the world has grown as we've become more globalized. There are transnational business organizations. And if you watched one of my Ed Puzzles earlier, the quick reviews, then you saw Coca-Cola is one of them, right? They're, they have their arms everywhere, all over the world, even in the most remote parts. Overseas competition to American businesses and a shift from manufacturing to service industries. That last one will probably need a little bit of an explanation, so I'll slow down there. I mean, you know, we just have tons of corporations that have headquarters, like you know, offices all over the world. Even Jello, you know, Kraft has headquarters here, but then they get stuff from all over the globe. I mean, that's just one example. You know, global communication has improved because of personal computers becoming smaller and more portable and more affordable. The internet has improved and facilitated global communication and so, and so social media. And of course the mobile smartphone has revolutionized. And that was created, was invented in your lifetime. Uh, Apple, iPhone 1 came out in like 2008, I think, and it's it's never been the same since. I remember that first time I could get music on my phone. Of course, I, I didn't buy a, a, an iPhone until I think iPhone 3 came out. It was just so, it was the bee's knees, man. Whew. 
compared to that flip phone thing, you know, that in order to text, it was awful. International businesses, there have been more international businesses that have developed in the last 30 years just because um, we can, we, there's a market for our products, American products all over the world, like Coca-Cola, for example. Production are usually held in more country than just the United States. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. You can see right here, a car. Ford might have its headquarters in Detroit. But they get their parts from all over the globe and they're shipped here, right? And then they're assembled here. So we could get parts from, from China and, and Argentina and, and Kenya, Africa, and that could be shipped here and then assembled here in, in, in a totally different country than all of those. Or maybe even, you know, uh, assembled in Mexico. Like it, 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 it's, it's changed the way that we, we do business. And this has caused a lot of challenges especially to local communities like Circleville. Why do you think so many of our factory jobs have left? Here in this town, because we're in the Rust Belt and it costs lots and lots of money to hire union workers who need a retirement benefits and higher wages and health care, health insurance and all that kind of stuff. And so jobs just move other places. And at the same time, since World War II, no, really since the 1980s, we've had less and less manufacturing jobs and factory plants have been closing because, you'll, you'll see in a minute, we've also shifted another big change from manufacturing to service. We were a manufacturing economy in the late 1800s, early 1900s. We shifted since World War II to a service economy. What does that mean? Well, you know what manufacturing is. You stand on an assembly line and part comes to you and you add something to it, right? That, that, that's how you make a car. That's how you make a computer, whatever. Well, we don't do that here much anymore. One, jobs are shipped overseas. Two, we have robots doing them for us. So then where do the jobs end up? Well, they end up in the service sector then. What are examples of service jobs? A doctor is a service. He provides or she provides a service, a medical service for you. And lawyers provide legal services for you. And teachers provide educational services for you. And these are nice paying jobs, right? These are okay. You need a lot of training. You need to be willing to go to college for a long time to get these jobs. But... Most of the service jobs are not high paying. Mo a lot of service jobs are lower paying jobs. Where are you going to find a lot of those jobs? Well, we have a lot of them in Circleville. Retail sales, meaning you could fold clothes at the Gap or JCPenney, not make much money. You could work fast food not make much money. I know that you think $15 an hour is a lot of money, but that translates to about $30,000 a year. And that's just in this economy today, that's, that's really not enough to do all the things you need to do, like pay your rent, pay college debt, car loans, save for vacation, save for the future, Safe your kids college and it's just it's, it's the service sector jobs just don't pay as much as they used to. And because of overseas competition, we have a trade deficit. What that means is we are buying more goods from foreign countries than those foreign countries are buying goods from us. You want to have more exports than imports. Exports mean money is coming to us from other places. We're producing it here and then shipping it there and they pay us for it. But instead, it's being made over there and we're paying for it to be shipped here. 
and that's hurting our economy. I mean, look at our trade deficit. We had we used to have as about as many goods exported as imported, and that's that's relatively healthy. But then it started going down, and then trade deals started happening that made it. You know, we have a ton more imports and exports now, and that's not healthy for an economy. If you want to get a job in this new service sector, these statistics, I mean, there are jobs available that where you can make some good cash, biomedical engineers, networks system, like, you know, this is like um, cutting edge medical science research, cutting edge high tech computer jobs. And even these two, home health aides and personal home care aides, um, can pay well. They, they don't always, but right. These, this up here takes a lot of training and education if you want to get those high paying jobs. These right here, you still have to get education. You can't just show up one day and say, I'm a home health aide. Like, you got to, you got to have training. It's not like in your grandparents' and great-grandparents' day when they didn't need to have any skills. They could show up at a factory, get a job, and then just do the same thing over and over again every day, you know, just like tightening a bolt every day. Like You don't need a skill for that. You don't need training for that. You don't need a college education. You have to, and if I can give you some advice here, you have to have some kind of training. If you're going to make it in this world, you, you can't. Do the same thing that your grandparents and great grandparents did because there's no more rca hopefully there will still be a dupont and a ppg but uh, those jobs are scarce what should you be able to know here yes hun there are not enough seats okay so i left mom's car just one car over from or two from where you were parked okay the key is in the glove box and the passenger door is unlocked. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Will we see you at church? Almost certainly not. Okay. All Sorry. Right. Bye. Love you. Bye. I love you. Thank you for your indulgence with this. Even Batman doesn't care that I'm talking to my wife. I'm sorry. This is the best I can do, guys. I'm sorry. I suck. I know. What should you be able to know about that last content statement? Analyze how American economy, how the American economy has been impacted by improved global communications, international trade, transnational business organizations, overseas competition, and the shift from manufacturing to service. It's a lot of stuff. There probably won't be very many questions on that one. Maybe one, maybe on the end of course exam. Last two content statements are about your your generation, the things that have happened since just a little bit before you were born and ever since. Content statement 32, focusing on domestic policy, that means things that are happening here at home in the US, not in a, across the world, but here in the US, the United States faces ongoing social, political, national security and economic challenges in the post-Cold War era and following the attacks on September 11th, 2001. You might remember Cold War ended in the early 1990s. That presented changes for us. We've got to find a new way to, to live without the threat of communism everywhere. Then September 11, 2001, the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center, that changed our society too. In other words, these two things are providing a lot of uncertainty. So in a world where there are a lot of new uncertainties. How should Americans, the people, and our government respond to these new uncertainties, especially when we're talking about things here at home in the U.S.? How do we keep Americans safe today? Well, 2001, just a few years before you were born, right after the September 11th attacks, the U.S. Patriot Act, USA Patriot Act, I just call it Patriot Act, tried to answer that question. How do we keep people safe? The federal government through this law was allowed to use our cell phone records, our banking activity, get our bank statements 
look at our internet searches. The goal of that was to find terrorists and stop terrorists. And a lot of what they were doing through the Patriot Act was just looking at suspected terrorist activities. Over time, it expanded to the possibility of U.S. citizens having their data scanned too, meaning non-terrorists might have their financial records and their phone records and their internet records looked at as well in order to keep us safe. How do you feel about that? It's less and less of an issue now because we've gotten more and more paranoid about that. But at the time, after 9-11 attacks, uh, people, a lot of people seem to think it was pretty necessary. How else are we kept safe? TSA stands for Transportation Security Administration. If you don't know who those people are, it might be because you haven't flown. I asked a lot of you if you've flown before, and let me tell you, flying is fun. It's scary. Going through the TSA checkpoints, they're the people in the airports that screen your luggage. It takes some time, and sometimes you get frisked. And sometimes you get taken out of line and interrogated just because they have to do that sometimes. Isn't that right, Craig? Yes, Mr. Beavers, it's kind of annoying. But it's supposed to keep us safe, right? How else are we kept safe? Well, what is Islamophobia and what is xenophobia? Islamophobia is the fear of people who believe in Islam, especially right after September 11th, people who were from other countries who believed in Islam. And xenophobia is fear of foreigners. The fear that was kicked off by the September 11th attacks was one of the strong reasons why we had tightened security in our airports with our surveillance, the government surveillance. Right? And then, of course, there's also domestic terrorists too, people who like to cause violence just because they like to cause violence that are here in the United States. That also leads to tightened security measures like these two things on here. We have federalism. You know what federalism is because you've, you remember that from content statement six, national government level, state government levels, power is divided between the two. Which should have more power, the states or the federal government? When it comes to LGBTQ plus rights, who should have the power? Who's going to protect those rights better, do you think? Legalization of marijuana and recreational use of marijuana. Who should decide that? Should the federal government decide that for every state or should the states decide? Gun rights and gun regulations. Should the states decide what rights people have with guns or should the federal government decide? Racial equality and gender equality. Who should decide? I mean, this gets into even, you know, uh, transgender issues, like transgender restrooms and transgender gender sports athletes and so on. Who should decide what we're doing with all those things? the states or the federal government. What about healthcare? And should healthcare be universal, meaning like tax dollars are used to pay for everyone's healthcare so that we don't have to have pay for our own health insurance anymore. The federal government pays for it using our tax dollars. Should the federal government decide that? Should states decide that? What should we do? So that's another thing that we've had to kind of decide. Not another thing, like five different things there. What about the economy? Globalization, that interconnectedness of the world, increasing interconnectedness, connectedness, is causing changes. What should our place in the world economy be? Should we be the world's economic leader? And should we be the ones that are, you know, calling a lot of the shots? Or do you think China should be? Or Russia? Or no one? Well, somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to have the most influence. Who should it be? Post-war, post-Cold War defense spending. 
now that there is no more Soviet Union communist threat, how much should, should we spend on the military? Should we decrease our spending in the military? Or should we increase our spending in the military? Maybe the Soviet Union is not here anymore, but there's Russia, there's China, there are terrorists. What should we do with the military? When you all were youngsters, there was something called the mortgage crisis of 2007, 2008. This was about the time that President Obama was elected to office for the first time. There were business bailouts during that time period. We also call that time period the Great Recession. The economy stalled for not just like a year, it was like three or four years. It was, it was very much impacted our politics. Um, it started, if you remember, it's called a mortgage crisis because of loans for houses. Should government lenders be allowed to make risky loans? Should the government allow mortgage lenders to make risky loans to people who can't afford the house that they're getting a mortgage for? that they're getting a loan for. And if they make risky loans and their business fails, their bank fails, whatever, should the government bail them out? Should the government ever bail out failing businesses? Give them money to keep operating. And it wasn't just like lending institutions, banking institutions. It was also places like General Motors. The federal government under President Obama was basically running General Motors for a while until they could get back on their feet. Now they don't owe the government anything. They paid back everything that they owed the government, but still, like, should the government step in and do that or not? Like, is it too big to fail or not? Like, do we just let it fail? What do you think? These are issues, all of these that I've just talked about, that are not resolved. And your generation, Yours, your generation and Craig's generation and Batman's kids are going to have to deal with. What will you do with these, these things, right? That's what this content statement is about. And you know what? So is this next one. We'll get that in a second. What should you be able to do with this? You should be able to explain the social, political, economic, and national security challenges the United States domestic policy faced in the Cold War period and following the attacks on September 11, 2001. There's supposed to be a sound there this be a sound darn you PowerPoint there's be a sound there sound effect yeah, whatever that was anticlimactic last one thank the Lord thank the Lord shut up Batman the end of the Cold War and September 11th terrorist attacks changed how the U.S. deals with not just home, that's 32, but 33 with the rest of the world. Some economic challenges that you're going to have to face, you. The American currency. The U.S. dollar is going up and down over the past couple of decades as far as its value especially compared to the rest of the world's currency. When I was going to college about 21 years ago, when I graduated from college, the American dollar was not very strong. When I went to Europe, I had to spend $2 for every one euro that I got. Now, the American dollar is a lot stronger. Imagine that. It's basically one-to-one, -one, one euro to one dollar. And that's, that, that's been very helpful, right? But what, what's your generation going to do to help keep that, that strength? What's your generation going to do with this balance of trade problem? Because we import more than we export. Remember, that's called a trade deficit. What's your generation going to do about fixing that problem? What about international economic partnerships? Should we join the World Economic Forum? Should we join... 
the World Trade Organization have more to do with those things or less because we'd be giving up some of our freedom and independence and autonomy as a country. But maybe that's good. Goes back to the League of Nations, doesn't it? What's your generation going to do about outsourcing? You remember what outsourcing is? Outsourcing is when American businesses move their factories to other countries because the people living in those other countries will work for less pay. Imagine that sometimes it's cheaper for like your phone manufacturer, for iPhone or, or Samsung to have the phone assembled in China or Taiwan shipped all the way across the ocean and then sold here. It's cheaper to do that than to pay an American a living wage, health insurance. What's the other thing? Retirement, those kind of things. What's your country, what's your country, what's your generation going to do about outsourcing those jobs going overseas to Mexico, to China, to Taiwan, to Thailand? to South Korea. Don't you want Americans to have jobs? And really, I just I tried to make this point earlier. There, there are few good jobs left in the United States that don't require a lot of training. Almost every job that your generation has or are going to be going after requires some kind of training after high school. You can't just quit learning after high school. Social and political challenges. This one, pandemic diseases, doesn't need to be explained since you've lived through COVID-19. Hopefully that's pretty much over. Have you looked at COVID deaths and hospitalizations lately? You might be surprised at the numbers. Challenge, another social challenge. Immigrants and refugees from other countries. Refugees, especially, that are fleeing from war-torn areas, like, for example, in your lifetime, Syria. So much devastation there. Does it surprise you that we were on one side and Russia was on the other side? And now there's all these Syrian refugees, and they've, they've been uh, going to Europe, and the Europeans are having to deal. I found this on the web. Oh, Syrian refugee crisis. There you go. Like, more than a million people. And... European countries are like freaking out. They have been for about five years now. What are we going to do with all these refugees? And Donald Trump had to decide, are we going to take these refugees? And for a long time, because of COVID, we stopped allowing refugees in because of COVID. And President Biden is starting to allow refugees back in. This is something we're going to have to deal with, right? International humanitarian aid, money that goes to help people out. In other countries that have poverty, that have famine, that have whatever, maybe if you, like Ukraine, they're war torn. Like, how much money should we give to those people over there when there's so much poverty over here? This is just what the content statement says enemy combatants, should we be able to use torture methods like, do you remember? What's the torture method where you simulate drowning, but you don't actually drown somebody? Remember what that's called? Should we be able to use waterboarding in order to get information about the troop movements of enemies? Upcoming terrorist attacks. Now, we don't do that anymore, but we used to. Should we be able to do stuff like that? Your generation is going to have to answer that question. Military matters. After the Cold War ended, after... Soviet Union fell, we didn't need to spend very much, as much money on the military because there was no Soviet Union to, to fight. There was no more Cold War to fight. But then, after we cut military spending, spending increased in the early 2000s when the war on terror began to try to combat terrorism around the world, especially in Afghanistan. And you remember the other country? That's right, Iraq. The United States sorry, should the United Nations, that new international peacekeeping organization, should it be the one to address peace issues like in Ukraine, like in the Middle East? 
do we trust that international organization to make the best decisions or should the United States lead the way? Should the USA lead the way? What do you think, Captain America? Oh, wait, I don't like Captain America. What do you think, Iron Man? Iron Man would just want to make money, right? What do you think, Batman? Batman's, he's out of it. What do we do about weapons of mass destruction that terrorists might have or other countries that don't like us might have? Should we allow Iran to get nuclear capabilities? Should we allow South, or sorry, North Korea to get nuclear capabilities? Questions you're going to have to answer. Of course, you, you know that George W. Bush got us into Iraq, the war in Iraq, because of he said there were weapons of mass destruction there, and then we never ended up finding any, right, based on faulty intelligence. And again, these issues, most of them, are not resolved. Your generation will have to deal with them. What should you be able to do with this very last content statement? You should be able to explain the social, political, economic, and national security challenges the United States foreign policy faced in the post-Cold War period and following the attacks on September 11, 2001. That's it. That's a lot. You probably are not done with this in one class period, and I apologize for that. I did the best I can. I absolutely did the best I can, and I feel terrible that this lasted so long and that this was so disorganized. I did the best I could. This has been brought to you by... Wake up, man. Wake up. This has been brought to you by... Batman Productions Group, LLC Incorporated Copyright. Who do you think was the best Batman? Was the Michael Keaton, the original movie Batman, who is now in the new Flash movie that's coming out? Christian Bale? Ben Affleck? The sparkly vampire guy from Twilight? There's a couple others, too. Val Kilmer, I think. There's another Batman. Which one was best? Thank you for your, your time and your, your attention. I really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. And gals, guys and gals are awesome. Thanks.